you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never leave the human community without a without a living imam to kind of guide us, if you will. Yeah. So so um this is the kind of the history or the the genealogy, if you will, of uh, Imam Razvi alayhi salam. It turned out that just on the um, first kind of class, what's called the Antrittsvorlesung, the very first class of the Academy of World Religions, when it was founded back in 2011, which was basically the fruits of the work of, of Imam Razvi, having taught and, uh, and uh, basically taught there for many, many years. He, his livelihood was teaching at the university and this idea of the Academy of World Religions at the University of Hamburg was his brainchild, if you will. Mm -hmm. and, and he pushed it through all of the bureaucratic hurdles to, to get that in place and get all of the professors in place from all of the different religions all across the globe. And he basically, you know, he attended that class and then somebody told me, look, look, that's, that's Imam Razvi, you know, if you want to talk to him, it's like, yeah, I want to talk to him, right? And so, you know, after the class, I went and talked to him and I'm telling you, you know, first impressions are everything. You know, I, I met this guy, he's Imam Razvi. He's he's maybe a little bit, you know, shorter than I am. And he's got this wonderful flowing long white beard. And he's just got this aura, like this, this incredible white light filled aura of energy. That's really hard to describe that I've seen only like in a few occasions with some, you know, maybe Sufi sheikhs, you know, Sufi teachers that I've had the pleasure of meeting and learning from in my life as well. Sunnis also, you know, Shia and so on, doesn't matter the Madhab. Yeah. And um, and they just have this inner light because, you know, they've been working on themselves, like grinding on themselves for like so long that like this this inner light just kind of shines forth, right? And so um, he just had this inner light. And I was like, can I take classes with you? And he's like, yeah, when do you want to come? And so we kind of made a date and uh, we figured it out. And then we kind of agreed after the first you know, appointment at his, which was at his own house. And we kind of did, you know, one-to-one -one sessions. So I was basically his last kind of master student, mm, if you will, right. because um, I was his last student, you know, to really take private classes with him. And I was there every Friday after Friday prayer. I would go to his house and he would set up tea for us. And, um, you know- So you guys really had a student-teacher relationship. That was one of the things yeah. I always wondered about your relation with Imam Rizvi. Is yeah, yeah. it somebody, because, you know, I, I have people who I feel I learned from for, from right. a distance who I would say right, right, in right. some weird way are, are my teachers, but you really had the experiential student teacher relationship with him. It wasn't something you were uh, admiring from afar and just were trying to read as much, but you really had that. I'm able to ask questions. I'm able to experience this guy and not just see him, how he, the game face he puts on for media, but actually see him in, a, in many different lights, which I think is very important to, because uh, we don't get that nowadays too much um, with what you're describing. Um, and I really wish we, we could get back to something like that. And uh, just to uh, go into Sayyid Mahdi Imam Rizvi's uh, history, because I find sure. him to have a very interesting history. He's mm -hmm. uh, not of, um, I would, he, is he of Persian origin, but he was from Bukhara or, uh, the, it, you know, so, so yeah, I'll let you explain all that because him, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bukhara and Zaidi is a uh, very interesting. Yeah, yeah. We expected Zaidis to come out of Bukhara. <laughs> yeah, I think it's worth going into. So, I mean, definitely, let's let's go into first of all, maybe a little bit about Zaidi Islam. So, Zaidi Islam obviously emerges from Imam Zaid alayhi salam and from his students, and their, um, you know, and their basically look upon. Um, the uh, Ahlul Bayt, the phenomenon of Ahlul Bayt, of the family of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and the descendancy and kind of the right of transmission of Imamat, so the right of, of kind of assuming the mantle of being the Imam for a certain group in a certain context in a certain generation, right? So, um, so uh, if you don't mind, I'll just start from the very kind of historical top and kind of break it down, and then we'll end up at Imam Razvi, because I think then that answers kind of all the questions, I hope. Um, so, so basically what happens is that, you know, Imam Zaid and Imam Bakr are brothers, half brothers, uh, and, and basically, you know, Bakr is significantly the, the elder and, and his strategy in terms of Bani Umayyah, in terms of how to deal with this oppressive situation for the Shia is basically to, you know, hold back and, you know, focus on education and teaching 
and basically, you know, have a have a, a distant but somehow a non-violent relationship with with Bani Umayyah and uh and pass you know, the tradition on to 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 his sons and, and their sons and their generations. And basically, on the other hand, Imam Zaid is saying, you know, we have to act now. And mm -hmm. it's important that we, you know, reaffirm the example of our grandfather, Imam Hussein alayhi salam in Karbala. And basically, it's important that we go out and we resist, physically resist also with our bodies and our wealth and our lives, um, you know, this oppression and this falsification of Islam, right? Through the Bani Umayyah. So, so they kind of, you know, they, they have this discussion and basically even Imam Zaid historically asks permission of Imam Bakr, who's his elder, you know, can I go out and do this? And Bakr says, basically, you can do it if you're ready to see your head on a spear basically being paraded through the city, because that's what's going to happen. That's, you know, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, and you can get the much more eloquent and romantic um, yeah, of course. historical exchange, you know, from any kind of um, Zaidi or, or Shia, uh, you know, uh, historic historiography, if you will, or historical work, but that's the essence of it, okay? And um, so basically, you know, he goes through his thing, he obviously is martyred, his body is severed. Uh, there is actually a, a mausoleum in um, the city of Filla in Iraq for Imam Zaid, which many people don't know. I think many Zaidis don't even know that, um, that they can do ziyarat actually at the uh, at the, uh, the Muslim of Imam Zaid, alayhi salam. Uh, of course, the going to Iraq is another story. If you're not in Iraq, <laughs> going to Iraq is another story, but it can be done. Um, and Have you, have you uh, made it there? Uh, in... I haven't, I haven't, I okay. haven't, I haven't. But I haven't had the chance and, and um, I'm not sure that's my destiny for now, you know, because I want to do my obligations first and I still need to go to Mecca and uh, do the Hajj. So I think my first step will be, inshallah, to go and do the Hajj before I do, you know, all these other kind of, you know, Shia uh, ziyarat or, or travels to the different imams and so on. Mm -hmm. I'd like to first fulfill my very fundamental Islamic obligation and, and do Hajj. So, but Allah will, will guide me, I'm sure, but uh, to Allah. But anyway, so the, the basically the background is, you know, after a lot of deaths and, and kind of a, a schism, if you will, between those students, it's more the students than the brothers, because the brothers, you know, loved each other and they agreed. Um, they kind of agreed that each would kind of do their own thing. And, you know, there was it's not like there was an argument between Zaid and Bakr about this, right? So so anyone who says that is, is not really looking carefully at the history, if, if you ask my humble opinion. So so they're getting along pretty well, but then the students kind of are not getting along very well because, you know, the one side of the students is saying, you know, our imam died for you and you didn't, you know, kind of join us. And then the other group of students is saying, you know, we asked you to stay with us and basically, you know, keep it cool and let's you know develop it slowly and strategically and go step by step right so so it's more like the clashes between them the students and they kind of you know each develop their own theology and you know then you kind of have this group of theological students that believe that any um descendant male you know well-minded uh physically sound just you know there are many qualifications for what makes a Zaidi Imam, but basically anyone from the Ahlul Bayt can become, under these conditions, any male mm -hmm. uh, can become an Imam who has the right to represent theological knowledge and all of that. You can find uh, the 14 different characteristics. You can find them in the in the Zaidi works. Um, and, uh, and, so, and so, you know, you kind of have these Imams kind of popping up all over the place. Um, you know, in the, in the ensuing generations, you have one Imam called Idris, who ends up going to Morocco, and he actually forms a Zaidi imamat in Morocco, which lasts the Idrisids uh, in Morocco, who lasted, I don't know how many years, maybe 400 years with some intermissions. Um, and then you have, you know, another set of Zaidi imams that goes to Tabaristan in the north of Iran, and they form a Zaidi imamat for maybe 200 years with intermissions. And, you know, so you have this kind of, you know, a short-term kind of short-lived phenomenon of Zaidi Imams. And then in the meantime, you know, uh, on another chain, you have Jafar Sadiq, you have his theology, and Sadiq was one of the, the great, you know, jurists of his time, having kind of canonized a lot of the uh, fit of what would become the Twelver Shia, what are now today called the Twelver Shia or the Jafari Shia. They're named Jafari because they follow the jurisprudence of uh, Imam Jafar, alayhi salam. 
And although it was Imam Zaid who first brought up the, 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 the first fiqh book and the first real compilation of hadith were actually brought up by Imam Zaid, salam, which many people also don't know, right? Yeah, I didn't know so, that was actually news when you dropped it on me as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, so if you want to look back historically in terms of the timing, you know, the first hadith book is brought up is the Musnad by Imam Zaid, salam, and the first book of fiqh is the Majmu al-Fiqh by Imam Zaid. So you can even argue that these terminologies were brought out by Imam Zaid in the first place, right? So, um, and, and of course, his chains of narration are very short and, and, and very much, you know, close to the Ahlul Bayt because he's from the Ahlul Bayt and he's giving you these very short kind of condensed chains of hadith and the hadith that he's using, you know, tend to be very organized and structured in terms of, you know, this is washing, this is ablutions, this is prayer, this is Ramadan, this is zakat. And, you know, so if you look at this, you know, his works, they tend to be very concise and very, you know, applicable really for all of the schools of, mm -hmm. of Islam, really. So, you know, I would encourage... Which, to be honest, Zaydis uh, get a, have a very good reputation amongst the other schools, uh, from what I understand. You know, when I talk to the Ibadis, they always say Zaydis are the closest to us. When mm -hmm. I talk to Sunnis, they say out of Shia, Zaydis are the closest to yeah, us. Yeah, 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 exactly. You, you know, so uh, they always... And the uh, Shia too, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. in, we have uh, really good relations with the, with the 12 or Shia. You know, they consider Imam Zaid, alayhi salam, to be a brother of Abdul Bayt. I mean, you know, so, so yeah, I mean, we, we enjoy people that. people who are interested in the Mutazali side of things also have a, a take a liking to uh, Zaydi Islam from what uh, I've noticed uh, on, on various platforms, especially now that Mutazali Islam is a uh, Mutazali way of thinking is, is gaining a considerable amount of popularity um, mm -hmm. as with other many um, schools outside of uh, Sunni Islam. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, Mutazali and Zaidi are very close because uh, I mean, we Zaidis, we like to say, you know, we like to joke that we're Mutazali uh, with the connection to Ahlul Bayt. Yeah. So, uh, you know, reason brings us to stay within the Ahlul Bayt. That's basically our thing. Right. And the, and the Mutazali are kind of like, OK, you know, whatever it is, reason is the overwhelming, you know, criteria and and so on. And we're, we're fine with them. You know, we're, we have very good relation with the Mutazali as well. And uh, yeah, so what you said is correct. I mean, we kind of find ourselves in the middle of this kind of you know, um, you know, very high cooking, uh, high boiling melting pot, if you will, of all the different theologies within Islam. And it, it comes from that, you know, it comes from our respecting the Jafari Shia, the Ismaili Shia, all the Sunni Madahib, you know, the Ibadi Madhab, you know, all of the different Sufi traditions. We have, a, especially in the Bukhari line of uh, Zaidi Islam, we have a very close relationship to uh, to to Salaf to Sufism, and it's probably worth then um, completing the the big picture. Um, so to answer your question, which is you know all of these Zaidi uh, imamates kind of start to pop up all over the place, and so the families of the Zaidi tend to kind of diversify and uh, spread all over Islam, even though they're always you know a strict minority every place that they go, because you know either you have Banu Umayya or you have the Fatimids or then you have the Safavids. Um, you know, so whatever relationship you're kind of in as a Zaidi family, you know, you're always kind of like alone, somehow managing to get through, you know, with other guys, except in Yemen, where you have this phenomenon that, you know, a, a real political imam manages to, you know, grasp roots and stay there for more than a thousand years, which is quite, quite phenomenal, actually, the yeah. way that, that developed politically in Yemen. But for the rest of the Islamic world, you know, being Zaidi was always kind of like, you know, what does that mean, Zaidi? Why would you be Zaidi, right? And so, but as you said, I mean, fortunately, you know, we've managed to get along for, you know, 1,400 years or 1,250 years with pretty much everybody. So that's that's pretty good. And so finally, to to get to the Bukhari descendancy, so you see all these different Zaidi chains. You have the Idrisids in Morocco. You have the Hadawis in Yemen. And, you know, you have the Bukhari Zaidis in Central Asia and Afghanistan and and. Persia and, and Northern India, basically. And the way that develops is through the Sayyid Imam Jalaluddin Surposh Bukhari, who's, uh, you know, we call him Sheikh Jalaluddin or Imam Jalaluddin, alayhi salam. And basically, his thing is that, you know, he's not so focused on the Zaidi aspect of the Zaidi Madhab, but he's, you know, focused, and I would say much like Imam Zaid, alayhi salam, you know, yes, I'm Imam Zaid, yes, I'm writing books about fit and hadith. But at the same time, you know, a very intellectually astute and very spiritually profound human being. I mean, right? And um, and he's he's 
Jalaluddin alayhi salam is teaching also this spiritual depth or also this very profound uh, depth that finds its expression in Sufism and uh, and this reason also, this kalam, if you will, uh, through Mutazila Fawr, and he's teaching this Mutazila Fawr as well as the Zaydi fig, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and the, the kind of, you know, aqida or the, the dogma around the relationships of the imams and all that other stuff, right? So, so he's teaching these very profound levels as well. And his, he's got 22 children, actually, and his 22 children end up, you know, diversifying all over Central Asia, you know, Afghanistan, Persia of its time, Northern India of its time. And then, of course, the Mughals come and the, the whole empire with Akbar and, uh, and all of that comes around and the tolerance and the flourishing of of uh, you know spiritual aspects and, and intellectual aspects of Islam in in northern India in what we call today northern India um, happens at that time and so you under know, under Akbar yeah I mean that's when that's when you know this big flourishing of kind of uh, tasawwuf and uh, you know Islamic arts architecture um, of course it was Babur who was the first Mughal that came and captured you know those areas but it was but Akbar might have been the the uh, more famed because of the contributions you mentioned uh, and uh, you know back in my Salafi days I really didn't uh, rate Akbar too highly because of his deen Allahi but you know now uh, where I'm at in my understanding I, I, it's something I really want to look into because I think I might have a better appreciation for um, his his thinking than I than I did some five six years ago. No doubt, no doubt. I mean, you know, Akbar is a, is a is a is a fun character because he opens it so much, you know, that you could you could somehow almost accuse him of syncretism mm -hmm. if you weren't careful. But if you look at it properly, the way that you know Jalaluddin uh, alayhi salam taught it, and the way that his children, you know, taught it and brought it, his descendants brought it to the northern part of the Deccan. Um, you know, they taught that, you know, these fake questions and these aqidah questions are really not that important. You just kind of deal with them on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, get them done, but then you move on to the more deeper and the more spiritual and more intellectual aspects of Islam, the philosophical aspects of Islam, the intellectual aspects, you know, kalamat, you know, hukm al-Islam, ta'wil, and of course, tasawuf al irfaniyat And so you'll find descendants in the chain of uh, Sayyid Jalaluddin alayhi salam, who are Sunni Muslims, who are 12 Shias, who are Zaydis, who are Ismailis, and you'll find them all over the, the Deccan, right? So, um, so, and these kind of Zaydi families tended to continue, and one of these Zaydi families then that had a, a, a prominent position uh, in the British colonial Indian Empire was the family of Imam Razvi alayhi salam, right? Mm -hmm. And so he's learning, you know, this kind of Zaydi tradition then from his father and his grandfather and uh, all the way down the chain, basically, that's been taught kind of privately within the family and the families of Zaydi Muslims throughout the Deccan. And you'll find, you know, Zaydi families today in Pakistan, you'll find them in Bangladesh, you know, um, all over the Deccan today even, right? In Hyderabad, I think there's even a Zaydi mosque, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yeah, um, I've never known that. That's uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um and and so um and so that's where he's getting you know his all his traditions and all his wisdom and his in inheritance if you will as an imam of the Ahlul Bayt and because it's the Zaydi framework you know he's he can claim that right to say you know I am an imam of the Ahlul Bayt from my time right and um and uh, that's the way the Zaydi framework works you can have it's okay to have several imams at the same time in different contexts doing different work with different communities. And not every imam is the same imam as, let's say, you know, uh, Zayn al Abidin alayhi salam, right? Of course, not. we're not talking about that kind of level because that's an imam for all of the Muslims. But we're talking about for this particular context, you know, because there's a famous saying in Shia Islam, which is, you know, God will never leave planet Earth without an imam to guide humanity, right? And so for the Ismailis, you know, it might be the Allah Khan currently, or there are some different you know, chains of Ismailiyat still, you know, open today, or for the Zaydis, you know, it might be individual Imams, and of course for the 12th Mahdi, alayhi salam, who for them is in, is in living occultation, okay? So, um, but this is always a common theme in Shia Islam, is that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never leave 
the human community without a without a living imam to kind of guide us, if you will. Yeah. So so um, this is the kind of the history or the the genealogy, if you will, of uh, Imam Razvi alayhi salam. Mm -hmm.